I met Slash, I was at a, um, a little elementary school riding my skateboard. Just this kid on a skateboard went flying one day. It fell off and hit my head on the ground. It was a good seven foot drop too. The ground came rushing up to meet him at such a pace. I was like, oh, <laughs> this guy's got to be wounded. And he said, are you all right? And I said, yeah. It's, and I met him in school. My teacher was chasing me around the room and chased me into his room. His teacher was yelling at him. And that was that was right before we did the entire seventh grade together. And then after the class was over, we got together and sang King Todd on the third floor railing of the, of the school, right on the edge of the little railing. And the teacher came out and freaked. And we were friends ever since. And that's how we met. And we've been friends ever since. I had a guitar and a little amp, and I invited him over, brought him to my grandmother's bedroom, showed him with one chord and one scale, put my Kiss record on, did all my age really positions. The thing that really inspired me to play guitar was uh, Steven Adler had an electric guitar at his house when I first met him when we were about 13, 14 years old. And uh, he used to plug this thing in and, and uh, just bang on it to Kiss records on full blast. That in and of itself was very exciting. And so I opted to play bass. Since he was playing guitar, I was gonna play bass. And I went around to a local music school. I didn't have an instrument. And uh, went in there and talked to the teacher and I said, you know, I wanna learn how to play bass. And he just sat me down and tried to ask me a few questions, trying to sort of figure out what it was that I was really getting at, what I, what I wanted to achieve. And while he was talking to me, he was playing some Eric Clapton licks, I think cream licks on, electric guitar and I was like that's what I want to do because I really didn't know that much about guitar at the time and so that was it and then I, I switched over to guitar and my grandmother gave me a, a beat up old Spanish acoustic that had one string on it. I started learning on the one string. There was no stopping me at that point. I was so obsessed with it. No matter what obstacles or hurdles there were I never accepted no for an answer, and I just kept at it. Izzy, as he became known at school, is from Lafayette, the same Indiana backwater as his partner in crime, Axel Rose, or Bill Bailey, as he was called back then. So Izzy recalls how in the town, they basically rode bikes, smoked pot, got into trouble, and it was pretty Beavis and Butthead, actually, Izzy said. So he first met Axel at Jefferson High School in the mid-70s. Izzy went on to say, I remember the first day at school, there was this big effing commotion. I heard all these books hit the ground yelling, and then he went running past me. A bunch of teachers chasing him down the hallway. So the next time Izzy and Axel would see each other, they'd be sitting next to one another in a driver's education class, and that's really where their friendship began. He thought that his crazy new friend might make a great frontman. And it was Izzy who persuaded the flame-haired youngster to have a go at singing. I thought, well, here's a guy who's completely crazy. He's a great singer, though. We had to coax him a bit, and it didn't go so well in the early days. Sometimes he would just come over and stand around like he was embarrassed. Or he'd start to sing, and then he'd just leave. Or he'd just walk out, and I wouldn't see him again for like three or four days. So it was in the early 80s, and Izzy was living in a small apartment in Huntington Beach, an L.A. suburb, where he was occasionally joined by his old indie pal Axel. So Izzy said he came out like three times before he stayed. Then he probably at the end of 82, he came back out with his girl and rented an apartment. And that's when we finally stayed. Forming a band together just seemed like the obvious thing to do.
I just saw a picture of Izzy and Axel. I said, Slash, if we get these two guys and another bass player, we could have the, the best rocket band. And it was for Flyers where we saw them. And we went to the show, and, and I was right. And we asked them. You know, we met Slash. We ran an ad for a heavy metal punk glam guitarist. <laughs> Blues influenced. <laughs> and Slash showed up, and we said, nah. But he kept popping up everywhere we were at, and all of a sudden we started working together. There was a newspaper called The Recycler, which was you could get everything from you know right. washing machines and lawnmowers, cars. Right. And they had musicians wanted musician things in the back. And I went through this, like, what am I going to do? And there was a guy named Slash, you know, influent, needed a bass player. I had a bass. I had a, I don't think I had it. I might have had a little amp. And I went and met Slash and Steven Adler down at the Cantor's restaurant. Wow. They had a bottle of vodka and... Uh, we just talked about music. I had blue hair. They had this long hair, and it was that again was kind of culture shock. I'm sure I was me walking in with like this. I had this my, my pride. I still have this black and red like John Shaft pimp long leather jacket and blue hair, and it had an Anarchy A on the back of the jacket. You know, classic. Um, and uh, so I think we probably shocked each other, but we all talk the same language as far as music went. And I went to, Slash took me back to his house that night, a few blocks away, his mom's house. He played guitar. And I'm like, you're not old enough to play like this. Like I'd never seen anybody play. Like he plays, like he does now. He played like that then. How old was he then? 19. Sure. Then I met Izzy. Things happened pretty quick, you know. Izzy moved into the <laughs> shitty apartment building across the street from mine. I saw this guy looks like Johnny Thunders. He's got like the long pimp jacket too. <laughs> He's at the phone booth, um, and we we talked. And he goes, "I'm starting this band. Uh, me and my friend, this, this singer Axel." And I'd seen Slash had taken me to see this gig at the Troubadour, where Axel was the singer of an early version of Ellie Guns. And I saw this guy come out, and he was like Henry Rollins. You know, he was that intense and real. And like I backed up a few steps, like one of those guys. And this I was loved, the I thing. Did. Once I think once it was Axel and Izzy. We started playing together. It wasn't Slash and Steven at first. It was the two other guys. Slash and Steven were with Tracy Guns. Uh, no, uh, Tracy Guns and this guy Rob Gardner were, okay. were in Guns first. Izzy and I booked this kind of punk rock tour because I was used to doing this this West Coast. I knew all the club guys and, and the crash houses where we could crash. It was all done. We had a guy who would drive our gear. We got a U-Haul trailer. And um, and that that was kind of the like shit or get off the pot moment for, for guns and the history our history. Um, Tracy and, and Rob were just like, we had never done like a tour and like didn't put, uh, these are punk rock tours then were not like exactly knew where you're going to sleep that night you didn't know exactly how you were going to eat but i'd done it so many times and izzy and axe were like okay let's go we got gigs booked let's go and and um those two guys um rob and, and tracy just like basically last minute like we're, we're not going to do it that just sounds too you know uh winging it and to me, that was normal. Like that's normal. these were normal that's things normal. you that's, did. That's what you do. And um, and that was we're not, we're not we're not canceling this tour, man. And that's when uh, we got together with Slash and Steven. But more than that, that the, when we got together with those two guys, the, it was the th first three chords we played. It was like, oh, that was the best move we've ever made. And and we were off to the races. Went and did that. Tour. Well, we only made the first gig, which was in Seattle. A car broke down in Bakersfield, so we hitchhiked the five of us to Seattle. You know how far <laughs> that is, right? We hitchhiked. Oh my God! Who picked so, all five of you up? Eleven hundred miles. We hitchhiked. A thousand miles. We were eating onions out of the onion field and like Bakersfield, and uh, we had thirty-seven dollars. All right, between us. So we went to the truck stop. 
and there was a trucker there. The guy was tweaking out of his mind on crank. He said, uh, he said, we need a ride. We're going to Seattle. He goes, I'm going to Medford. How much money you guys got? Medford, Oregon. Yeah. How much money you got? We got 37 bucks. All right, give me your 37 bucks, and I'll take you to Medford. And the guy was, we all got in the cab, you know, like the sleeper, like our guitars. And uh, the guy did, he got us to, he dropped us off at one point in, in Sacramento. It was like 110 degrees, man. And we're at the like the Capitol building on the lawn. There's water fountains and stuff. And the trucker takes off. We're like, he's dumping us here, man. But he, I think he just went to go get more crank. And sure enough, he came back around, got us like in an hour or two. Got us to Medford. Um, we hitchhiked. We got one ride from Medford on the I-5, you know. Uh, this Mexican guy with his little pickup, but we all got in the back and the, it was rubbing the tires. And he's like, I'm sorry, you guys. He took us like five miles, his back tires were smoking. I'm sorry, you guys, I, it's gonna ruin my truck. I wish you the best of luck. And then these, um, so we're out there, you know, now we're north of Medford somewhere. Uh, and uh, we're hitchhiking and it, that this, this pickup truck, a real one, like a regular size pickup truck with a cab in the back. These two women in their thirties, so they were old to us. They said, "You guys, where are you going? We're going to Seattle." They said, "Well, we're going to Portland. We can take you that far." But at this point, I'm like, "Okay, I'm thinking I can call a friend in Seattle, come down to Portland to get us." And we get in the back of these this girl's pickup. It was like that corrugated back, you know, cab. But they had a window up to the front, and they said, "You guys." They said, "Look, we passed you guys." And then we turned around and came back and got you because we used to hitchhike when we were hippie girls. Nobody would pick us up because of the way we looked. And we just did that to you. We passed you. And then we talked and we said, we just passed people that were like us. We passed them for the same reason because they don't look, you know, they look different. And they they, they were really sweet. I, I, I wish I would have remembered their names because they, they um, you guys hungry? You know, we're fucking starving. Okay. We're going to stop and get some gas. We'll get you guys some sandwiches. Just come on in the store with us. They got us some beer. You know, it was just like angels picked us up. And at that gas station, I called Collect to my friend Donner in Seattle. I said, man, we're on a mission. Dude, we're going to check in since Bakersfield. Can you come get us in Portland? He's like, I'll do that. And not only that, I'll throw you guys a party when you get to Seattle like nobody's ever seen. So we get to Portland. There's Donner. He picks us up. These women dropped us off good luck guys you know never got the trucker's name he was so tweaked out on, on meth i don't know um uh we got to seattle there was like this house party like beyond house parties there was barbecue and you know booze and uh chicks everything and uh it's like we've got to welcome my new friends you know seattle like this is our band Especially after that hitchhiking trip, we were a band. Yeah. Like, don't fuck around with us. It's over, yeah. Yeah. Um, the gig we played in Seattle, we, our gear didn't make it because the car broke down, so we borrowed the Fastbacks gear, who we were opening up for, a band I used to play in, play drums in. Um, there was nobody there. We sucked. Um, but it didn't matter at that point. So it's like a week or two later, they get back from that Seattle Hell tour. They're at Canner's Deli. They take their first photo shoot here because they book some gigs and they want photos to put on the flyers. Their, their first band photo was shot at Canner's. That, the look on their face in that picture, it says a million words. They know they're a force to be reckoned with. So they're now blood brothers because they suffered a little bit on the road in that Seattle tour. And they're just here to just book a bunch of shows and just take it over. And we we did it, man. We came back like changed people, I think, and a, and a united band. Anyhow, long story short, we we started playing all five of us together within maybe four months of me being here. So now it's eighty five. It's eighty five. I think our first gig ever was in June of eighty five.
it's really funny because like none of us are from Los Angeles, and everybody like tries to label us as an LA band, and we just all happened to have met there, and we were the only five guys that could have made up Guns N' Roses. I mean, we had different combinations of us in different bands, you know, throughout the time we were coming up and getting it together. And yeah, there was like one or two of the same yeah. guys. We couldn't, there was nobody else in LA we could have played with, so it was inevitable that the five of us would get together because that was it. I mean, there was no other combinations that were going to work. You know? We were the only five people that could actually, I mean, this was, was the only singer, that was the only guitar player, that was wherever they are. He's the only people I could play with to start a band with that I like. Same here. We went through so many different people, and this ended up being the people that we most believed in. We're like a family. We believe in each other. Who named the band? It was uh, a name that came from L.A. Guns and Hollywood Rose. So it was Tracy Guns and, and Axl Rose. Was Dude, Axl was super... He's like... He, super driven guy. He just had a bigger... Um, world view or our band like he's like we're, we're going this is going to be our next step and the next step and like okay that sounds amazing I don't know we're just writing songs in our shitty little place you put in the, the work you put in the 20 hour days you know day after day we rehearsed twice a day we were all in like we didn't have hobbies we didn't have other things that were outside of, it was all about the band we made like a mailing list. We had we did all this stuff to like push our band. We'd go after fans, you know, like keep on them, get their address, mail them flyers, you know, get the money for poaches, poaches stamps. And all you do is fold up the flyer, tape the top, put a stamp in their address and mail it to them. We felt separate from everybody else in in Southern California, not just LA. And we so we were like this little gang, you know, we protected each other, we did all that stuff. I worked with different singers for, you know, um, on and off for a while. And then when I met Axel and we started jamming together, he was the only singer that ever brought an emotional content to it that affected me um, on an emotional level, on an energy level, like really sort of like a song all of a sudden, uh, went to a whole new level and I, I felt it and that's when I realized you know where music and, and vocals really meet you yeah. know because prior to that everybody that I'd worked with sucked and I just I had no use for it and I would just rather play instrumentally than that but uh that's when I first really arrived at that that poignant feeling that you get when things connect uh, on a lyrical and, and vocal level and the music level. And then I came to LA and I saw all these people trying to be Eddie Van Halen. And it took five years to find somebody who played more from the heart rather than just trying to be the fastest and trying to do this and that to be a big rock star. Someone who, like, he'll be very quiet and stuff most of the time and really won't let a lot of himself out until he picks up a guitar. and then his heart and soul seems to pour out through the guitar. No what happens with this band, where it went, what we sold or it broke up, changed, whatever, or any other members that at that time it was the most important thing and it's like I like tattoos and I wanted something that would always remind me of what was once there, you know, a symbol of it. And so, you know, I got this the cross tattoo here. <laughs> 